November of 2014, Graham Morant returned home from a night out at a Sunday church service to find a note from his wife and her dead body. Jennifer Morant had taken her own life that night and was saying goodbye. But was it really as cut and dry as that? Or did Graham have something more to do with it than they initially thought? Hi guys, and welcome back to my podcast. I'm your host, Lulu, and today we're just gonna have a one-part case. It's the Jennifer Morant case. This is a heartbreaking case, in my opinion, because I feel like nobody should be, I don't know, pressured into committing suicide. And unfortunately, it happens a lot more than we think. When Jennifer and Graham got married, it was like a fairy tale. It was everything Jennifer could want, and the years felt like days that they were together because it was just so perfect. But as the years went on, Jennifer's health got worse. So Jennifer suffered from chronic back pain pretty much her whole entire life. And I know how that can feel, and I know how discouraging that can be. I actually have chronic back problems. I got diagnosed at 14 with a lot of back issues and I had been complaining about back pain since I was about eight years old. And there's definitely better days, but on the days where it's worse, sometimes I feel like I can't even get out of bed to go to work. And so I completely understand how exhausting chronic back pain can be. And it was really putting a stress on Jennifer and Graham's relationship. Her health began to go downhill fast. And Graham really didn't feel like she was the woman he fell in love with. And when you hit that point in a relationship, I don't get why you stay. If you don't feel like you wanna be with somebody, just leave. Pressuring anybody into anything like what happens in this case is very unnecessary. And because her chronic back pain was getting worse and worse as the days went on, it made her anxiety and depression also get worse. This left Jennifer not only suffering in her physical body, but also suffering in her head. At least that's the way Graham claims to see this situation. And I get that to a point. I also struggle with a lot of anxiety. And just like the chronic back pain, there are worse days. But I don't think, on my personal experience, it was as bad as Graham claimed it was. But his claims are all we can go off of because Jennifer is not here to tell us otherwise. Graham claims that Jennifer had been talking about suicide for a while. He said that she had told him that she was suffering so much, she just wanted it all to end. And he very much paints himself as the husband that just loves his wife and had helped his wife end her suffering. But I don't think that that's the case. And after a while of her suicidal claims, Graham began talking back to her about it and bringing it up in conversation and talking about different ways they could do things. He also started giving her her best options and tried to convince her that certain ways were the best route for her to take. That to me is how you know that that's not entirely true. Now, I just lost a friend to suicide, Um, and his was, he was really just done. And me and my sister-in-law started talking about it, and I have never been able to put into words how I feel when somebody loses themselves to something like that, because I don't think it's selfish. I think that that's what they wanted, and it's, it's selfish of us to want them to stay here when they don't want to, when they're ready to be done. I've never been able to come up with the words and my sister-in-law said it the best the other night. And that's what she said, that 
If a dog is sick, you put them down because it's selfish for you to keep them here while they're suffering. Why is that any different when it's people we love? The reason is because we don't want to imagine a life without them. People get upset when other people deny things like cancer treatments and they're mad and they tell them that they're the selfish ones, but that's not the case. And in this case, I don't think that that's how Jennifer felt. I very much believe that this was a bullied into situation and this is not something it should be. And there's a difference between supporting somebody who does want it to end, like chronically ill patients who are interested in the assisted suicide programs and bullying somebody into a life changing and ending situation. And I do believe that Jennifer was in that kind of situation here. And it seems like when him just mentioning it to her and talking to her about it and giving her these options didn't work, he started to remind her that she had three different life insurance policies that totaled out to be about $1.4 million. And with him being the only beneficiary, he would receive all of it. He began to tell her that she could be this, just this amazing person and give him all of this money and he could finally build a religious commune with it. This had always been his dream. He had always wanted to build this religious commune and had actually talked about it before any of this suicidal stuff had come up. And now he was seeing a way that he could do it. He could get this $1.4 million and finally do the thing he'd always wanted to do. And that's the way he painted it to her, that she could give him what he'd always wanted and his dream and he thought that that was going to be a way to get her to commit suicide finally. But that didn't convince her. And it was clear. What's the point in her getting that $1.4 million if she can't even use that? And I don't know if anybody was going to get a ton of money if I died and told me that I could make their dream come true. Yeah, I wouldn't do it either. Because that's my life. And you can make your dream come true in other ways. So I get why that didn't work. So then he decided to try to come at it in a different direction. He told her that the rapture was coming soon because he was very religious and she was religious as well. And he informed her that because of her depression and anxiety and chronic back pain, she would be way too weak to survive it and they would leave her behind. He continually told her this and told her over and over, it was coming, it was coming. And if she wanted her only ticket into heaven, then she needed to kill herself. And that also didn't work. And that's why I don't think that this is something that Jennifer wanted in the first place. There's a lot of other reasons, but there was so many times that he gave her an excuse. And she still didn't go along with it because she didn't want to die. And then when that didn't work, Graham decided to stoop even lower. He decided it was best to just pester her about it until she decided to go through with it. And that's what he did. He continually told her and reminded her that this was something that she wanted and tried to just convince her by pestering that it was her idea. And it's sad because those kind of things work. If you say something to somebody enough times, they're going to start believing it. And it does make me sad that that might have been some of what happened in this case. For months, she was getting pestered and told that no, she did want to kill herself, that this was what she wanted. And here's how you can do it. And you want to do this, right? And yeah, no, you want to do this over and over and over by the man that she loved, and it might have finally gotten to her to a point. And it did come out in later interviews that she was quoted by her best friend saying, I have to kill myself and Graham will be helping. And then she followed up with, but I don't want to die. She was scared. 
She told them that she was scared by the peer pressure that Graham was using on her to make her do it. And she was scared about what he would do if she didn't do it. As the days drug on, Graham could feel that money getting closer. He could feel that he was slowly breaking Jennifer down and knew that one day soon, he was gonna be able to build his dream. And after months and months of breaking her down, she decided she had made up her mind. They talked about the different ways that she could kill herself together. And Graham convinced her of one way that would work the best and be the least painful. Suffocation in a vehicle. They have CCTV footage of her and Graham at a hardware store. That's where they were picking out a generator. Graham was helping her pick out the tools to kill herself with. And he didn't seem upset at all in the videos. He assisted in helping her pick out the right one that would work. Then they bought it and headed home. Graham set it up. Graham, her husband, set up the generator that was going to be used to kill Jennifer without even being upset about it. He then showed Jennifer how to use it and then walked her through every single step she would need on committing the suicide so that way she would do it right. He then set up the generator and the vehicle together in the garage. And on the night of November 30th, 2014, Graham left the house to attend a Sunday event. As he was leaving, he told Jennifer that it was time. The car was in the garage. Everything was ready. She knew how to perform it, and he was leaving. Before he left the house, he gave her one more rundown on the proper way to kill herself to make sure the job got done. And when he returned home that night, he found her dead body in their car. He called the authorities, and when they arrived, they found her in her car with the generator and a note. Written on the note, it said, please do not resuscitate me. And we are still unsure if the result of her death was by Jennifer's decision or the pressure that Graham had placed on her. At the very beginning of this case, it seemed very cut and dry. It was a suicide. She had chosen to do it and did it when he was gone so that he couldn't save her. But every suicide is treated as a murder investigation at the start. The authorities have to conclude that it was a doing by the own person's hand and that it wasn't a murder or that nobody else was involved or anything like that. So even though it looked very cut and dry, when they began digging, they realized that there was a lot of things not lining up with this being just a normal suicide. And that's where Graham's story began to very rapidly unfold. He ended up pleading not guilty to the charges. He claimed in court that his wife would have ended her own life eventually, and he just helped her carry it out. The courts, however, did not agree at all with this. And the two friends that came forwards informed the jury about the fact that she did not want to kill herself, leading the courts and the judge to believe that Graham took advantage of her vulnerability. He used her depression and pain to make her feel like suicide was the only option. That, following with the fact that she would be his personal savior and let him do the one thing he's always wanted to do with his life. Graham shared bits and pieces of the story, which is why we know what we do about her death and how it was carried out. And during that time, the courts didn't feel as though Graham showed any remorse for what he had pressured his wife into. They had video footage of him that showed him willingly shopping for the tools that were going to kill his wife. And he didn't even look upset about it. Because of that, he was sentenced to a maximum of 10 years for counseling somebody into suicide. It was then coupled with a six year sentence for aiding in the suicide because he set it up for her 
and bought all of the tools for her. Those sentences, though, are being served at the same time. And they also gave him the chance for parole in October of 2023. This makes me really mad because I understand that Jennifer, yes, got into that car on her own, started that generator on her own, wrote that note on her own, but this was not her choice. And I feel like Graham should have gotten a lot longer than 10 years for assisting in her suicide because I feel like that was more like murder. And of course, he tried to appeal his case in 2020. He believed he was improperly convicted. His lawyers claimed that the way the judge gave instructions to the jury during the 2018 trial and how he summed up the evidence to the courts was incorrect. They wanted to do a retrial based on fresh evidence in the case and a new judge. And of course, in his attempts to appeal his case, some more information came to light. They had discovered some emails that were not originally brought up in the first trial. They contained a conversation about two months before Jennifer's suicide between a doctor and Jennifer's husband. In it, Jennifer's husband talks to the doctor about how she is suffering from her pain and how he's looking for information on how to help his wife. He informed the doctor that she had told him of her anguish and all the pain and had asked for his help personally on how to end her life in a peaceful manner. He just needed some directions on the most peaceful way to die, just so he could help his wife. But even though these emails were not available to Graham's lawyer during the initial trial, they don't believe it would have helped the case at all. If anything, it probably would have solidified the fact that there was a lot of premeditation and planning that surround this case. After all, the courts had proof that Graham had driven his wife to the hardware store, that they had collected the equipment together, that she needed to kill herself, and that he had aided in setting it up for her. They also knew that he had told her how to kill herself when he had left that day for his church outing. And of course, the two witnesses, her friends, that stated that she did not want to kill herself, was all the proof that they needed that she did not want to go through with this. The courts then and now believe that this was not a case where she just went and killed herself and Graham had found her and called the authorities. He gave her ideas he knew when he left that he was not coming home to an alive wife. And even knowing that she was going to be gone when he got home, he still chose not to call the authorities and inform them that his wife was suicidal, like he should have done. Therefore, he lost his appeal. Like I said, it's a little bit of a shorter case, but I do feel like it still needs to be covered. I feel like Jennifer might have felt like she had some support with her friends, but not enough support to get away from Graham. I mean, this was her fairy tale wedding. For a while, what happened, right? She might have thought at first he was joking, but he just kept pestering her. And somebody with depression to just pester and pester, they're going to listen to you, unfortunately. And I think that, that Graham knew that. And that's why he decided to treat it the way he did. Graham is still in prison to this day. He does not believe he did anything wrong. And he believes that he helped save his wife from her chronic pain, just like she wanted. But without Jennifer here, we will never know if it was actually something she was actively seeking out or something a greedy, money-hungry husband bullied her into doing. There may be false or misleading information throughout this podcast. All facts have been researched to the best of my abilities, but accidents do happen. If this is a story you are interested in knowing more about, I highly recommend doing your own research. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you next time.